When you start in sig figs at the beginning of the year, it's very common to quickly get into the mathematical component and lose focus of why sig figs are used in science class. So what I want to do is go through measurement and why we use sig figs, and then go through an explanation of kind of why the rules are what they are. Okay, so to explain why we use sig figs, I start off with three different boards. And let me get a different screen here so we can see this nicely. So what we have marked here is over here we've got zero, and over here we have 100. Okay, and there's a red dot right here. So the question is, where is that red dot? Okay, lots of different answers you can get. I have a second board. We have zero here, I have 100 here, and I have the same red dot in the same place as I had it before. So I shift it over a little bit. However, this board has every 10 centimeters marked. So I know that 60 is here and 70 is here. So in the first board, even though the red dot is in the same place, I'm not able to make the same measurement as I can with the second board. This is an, this is an inferior measurement tool. Oh, let me get these lined up. And the only difference between them is the number of lines I have. So the fact that this has a line spacing different than this means that this is a better measuring tool. And I can make a better measurement from it. If I were to measure this using this alone, I probably would have said it's about 60. But for my first measurement, I always said 60 centimeters. But with the second board, now I know it's between 60 and 70, and I have some idea of where it is between them. So for this one, I would probably say 63 centimeters. So by adding more lines to your measuring tool, your measurement should reflect that you've used a better measuring apparatus. I have one more board here. It's the same as the others. It starts at zero over here and ends at 100 over here. And this one has every one centimeter mark. So now I can see I have the red dot in the exact same spot as before, but I see here that it's 60, 61, 62, 63. It's between 63 and 64. And I'm not able to probably get the lines just perfect there. But now I can make an even better measurement by virtue of having more lines. So I would say this is 63 to 64, and it's a little closer to 63. So we're going to call that 63.4. Now some people would say, oh, that's what I said originally, back when I had the first one up, but really, to reflect the precision of your instrument, 60 is the correct measurement for the first board. 63 is the proper measurement for the second board. 63.4 is the proper measurement for the third board. If someone had said 50 or 70, that would not have been an unreasonable measurement. Over here, though, it would have. So you've changed the kind of rules that you go by as you change the lines. 64, 62 would have been okay here, but not here. Here I knew it was between 63 and point, or 63 point, 63 and 64. 63.3, 63.5 are acceptable measurements here, but if I had a different measurement, I might be able to kind of refine that even further, and then say, well, now with this new measuring apparatus. So what we're seeing here is that the number of line spacings, or the value of the line spacing on your instrument, on your measurement apparatus, dictates how many numbers you should write down for your measurement. Okay, so the rule of thumb is this. When you have your measurement between two margins, so the rule of thumb is this. When you have your measurement between two margins, so if I'm going to add in a measurement that's right here, and let's say this is 11, uh, and this is 11.1. Okay, really this would then be 11.0. So what you want to do is you want to write down the same number of decimal places as each line is worth. So each line in this is worth 0.1. So I want to use one decimal place. I know this is between 11.0 and 11.1. That's my range. What you want to do is you want to indicate where you think that is between those two. So you want to add in one more decimal place beyond the value of the one. So I would write this as 11.0 something. Now, I think that's more than 0.5. I would say 11.07. 11.06 would be fine. 11.08 would be fine. But I put it at 11.07 as my measurement, and then I would add the units in. 
Okay, so let's take a look at that with some actual with some actual measurements here. So I have a pair of pairs up here, and we're going to measure them using a meter stick. Frozen something else. So let's scoot this over a little bit so we can do this well. All right. So I tried to line this up. Now I'm not directly overhead, so this angle is kind of making it look like the pair goes further to the left. But when I hold the paper here at the edge of this, that paper is just touching the pair. Okay? So what I want to do now is I want to measure this. Now obviously a pair of pairs is very challenging to measure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and set this here so that from directly overhead the paper lines up. And I'm going to freeze it. Now I'm going to come over and I'm going to draw where that paper line is. So we get it just right. I'm going to unfreeze. I'm going to take away the paper. And then freeze again. And now I have my line drawn where the edge of the pair is. The second pair. So if I go and I look ahead at my markings here, and let's, let's clear up a little bit of space there. So I'm looking here, here's 4.5, 4.6, 4.7. So I know this is somewhere between 4.7 and 4.8. And that's in centimeters. So for my measurement, I want to add on one more place beyond that. So I would go ahead and say, okay, it looks a little closer to 4.7 than 4.8. I have some uncertainty in that. So I would say this is 4.74 or 4.73 and then centimeters as that. But what's important here is that each line here is worth 0.1 centimeters, and I'm going one beyond that decimal place. Okay, that's how you do your measurement. Now, this side right here is important. This is the measurement side. And then really this is what we stress early on in the unit. Then we start to get into numbers and you lose sight of this. That makes teachers unhappy. So if you see teachers complaining when you do labs about sig figs, that's because they want you to have an understanding of the number of the amount of numbers that you write indicates how good your measurement is. Okay? And that should kind of guide our process for what the rules are going to be for our sig figs. It's this idea that we're trying to communicate through our numbers how good of an, a measurement, how precise our measurement was. Now, for the number setting. Anytime you write a number one through nine, that is considered a significant figure. A zero will depend on its location within the number. So there's three ways to have zeros written. If a zero is off to the left of all of the other numbers, then it is not significant. If a zero is in the middle of a bunch of other numbers, it is always significant. And if the zero is off to the right of all the numbers, it is significant if a decimal place is present, and then not significant if there is no decimal place. Now, you've probably seen some kind of rules like that. You may have seen the Atlantic Pacific. But the idea here is if you look at zeros, this should make sense of what we said earlier. If we look at a zero to the right of a bunch of numbers with a decimal, so I write 4.0 centimeters, no one would ever write that mathematically. No one writes 4.0 because you don't need that mathematically. The purpose of that is for me to show that my measurement was so good that I have to include an additional decimal place even though it's zero. That's why that's a significant figure. If I write the number 404, that zero is part of my measurement because these two other components are surrounding it. So again, I have a significant figure here. But if I just write the number 400, I didn't write those zeros because I was trying to show my measurement. I wrote them because the numerical value 400, if I take away the zeros, it's just four. So I need them there from a mathematical standpoint, okay? If I write 0 0.04, believe it or not, I do need that zero there. And so that zero there is there for a mathematical purpose, not to show off my measurement, okay? The zero here is shown for properness. Okay? So, so when you're doing the numbers, that's kind of what you want to keep in mind. So, 
The hard part of sig figs usually is not going through and identifying what the correct number of sig figs is. Usually if we put up 3,030, say how many sig figs is that? Most people can come up with three and that they're these three. And if not, usually with a small amount of practice that becomes not too challenging. Usually the most challenging ones would be something like this, which really kind of incorporates everything. You have one, two, three. These three would count. You would have six significant figures. These would not be significant. Okay, but once you've done that, the multiplication, division, adding, and subtracting tends to give people a lot of problems. So let's start with a really simple example and kind of justify why the rules are what they are. Six times four. So in sig figs, six times four, six has one sig fig. Four has one sig fig. So when I multiply these together and my calculator spits out 24, that answer is too specific for my measurements. Let's actually add some units on to kind of clarify that. Let's say I'm doing the area of something and it's six centimeters by four centimeters. So I get an answer of 24 centimeters squared. Here's why we change that number to something else. When I say six centimeters, that's a bad measurement. It's not 6.0, it's six. So another way to think of that is it's somewhere between five and a half and six and a half. Where I have a range and it's a pretty big range. Alternatively, or along the same lines, Four centimeters is somewhere between three and a half and four and a half. I don't know precisely what those things are. They're not 6.000, it's six. So there's a measurement aspect to this that changes the mathematical kind of approach to it. Now if I take the smaller end of my range and I multiply those, 5.5 times 3.5 comes out to 19.25. 6.5 times 4.5 comes out to 29.25. So when I say six times four, you can't give an answer of 24 because you don't know where that is in this range. It has a very, very large uncertainty. So instead you have to give an answer that reflects that you did not use precise instruments. So instead of saying 24, we round that to one sig fig and say it's 20 centimeters squared, or you could say two times 10 to the one centimeters squared. That represents this range much better than 24 would. 24 would need to be kind of 23 to 25 range, or 23 and a half to 24 and a half. This makes sense with 20, which is somewhere 15 to 25, 10 to 30. That fits this, this particular thing better. So that's why the rules for multiplying and dividing are based on how many sig figs you have, okay? If we look at an example with addition, so I did 5.2, plus 112.213. Okay, so if I plug that into a calculator, and I don't worry about measurements for a second, uh, we'll say milliliters and milliliters, okay? So if I plug that into a calculator, I get 314.711, okay? However, if I look at the ranges on this, 5.2 is somewhere between 5.15 to 5.25. Whereas 112.213 is somewhere between 112.2125 to 112.2135. Okay, so now I'm going to add up the minimum values it could be in red here. I'm kind of wall this off. So 5.15 plus 112.2125 comes out to 25. 63.711. 117.3625. If, on the other hand, let me switch colors, if I add up the minimums, I'm sorry, maximums of the range, then I'm going to end up with 5364.117. So when I'm doing this addition here, I'm ending up with a range of 117.3625 to 117.4635. What's important there is to understand that this is the big range. It could be somewhere from 117.36 to 117.46. The fact that I knew that this one was 0.213, those one and the three really aren't contributing to my knowledge enough because this one is so uncertain. This has such a big range in that decimal place that the fact that I know this is 0 0.1, 0 
two one three, the one three don't factor in. Which would kind of be along the lines of saying, hey, I've got about five thousand dollars, and then someone gives you a dollar twenty-five and they say, How much money do you have now? Well, you don't know you have five thousand one dollars and twenty-five cents, because you didn't know whether you had five thousand and one dollars to begin with or four thousand nine hundred and eighty-seven dollars. So when you have an uncertainty for addition and subtraction, the answer you're going to end up with is going to be based on the most, uh, the least precise measurements, most precise place. So in that case, this two here is kind of the gatekeeper to what our answer should be. And that two should be where I round my final answer. The one and the three here can influence the rounding on that, but they're not going to be part of my final answer because I need to correctly communicate that this measurement limited my uh, certainty of my measurement. And so 117.4 milliliters, this one I base on decimal place, unlike the previous one with multiplying, where I based it based off of how many significant figures you have. Okay, so going through and looking at a couple ranges like this really should help you understand why the rules are what they are, and that should hopefully help when you're doing the problems to keep in mind that this is a measurement component thing. And that a lot of the mathematical things that you've learned in the past don't apply to this because we're dealing with ranges of numbers, ranges of certainties, ranges of measurements, rather than absolute numbers. When I write 5.2, it's not exactly 5.2, it's somewhere within a range of 5.2. When I write 112.213, this was a really awesome ruler that I used, and therefore I want to communicate that if possible. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, I graduated cylinders. Unfortunately, this one was not as good at graduated cylinder, so my answer can't be that good.